Scariest story you know, that is 100% true. Before my dad died, he once told me a story from when he was in Vietnam in the 1960s. He told me about a mission where he and one other American, with five CIDG strikers, South Vietnamese villagers turned fighters, were tasked to emplace seismic ground sensors along a trail networked deep in the jungle. He said they were about two days into the mission, when he and two other strikers split off from the main group to go watch a nearby trail intersection. He said the jungle was pretty quiet that day, just the sounds of birds and bugs and an occasional monkey. He said they've been watching the trail intersection for about three or four hours, and were deciding on whether to move further down the trail or run to the back and link up with the rest of the patrol. Before leaving the cover of the brush, my dad said he checked the trail ahead of them one last time and prepared his men to move. Now here's where the story gets interesting and he told the part with the absolute dead seriousness in his face. He said just as he started to step out onto the trail, he sees a light-skinned black Union cavalry soldier and full battle gear laying alongside the trail just shy of the intersection. My dad said the Union soldier had two pistols, a Spencer rifle and a short curved club at his hip. As my dad was trying to process what he was seeing, the soldier looked directly at him and smiled. Then the soldier slowly placed a finger up to his lips as if to tell him to be silent and then motioned my dad back off the trail. My dad said he signaled his men to remain hidden and recalled that he slipped back into the jungle on the other side of the trail. The Union soldier did the same on his side of the trail, and less than 10 seconds later he said the lead element of a group of NVA, North Vietnamese Army soldiers, walked right through the trail intersection some 30 feet away. My dad estimated that the group was compared to 70 to 80 soldiers equipped with automatic rifles, light machine guns, and rocket-propelled grenade launchers. He has no doubt that his entire team would have been wiped out on the spot. He said as soon as the enemy soldiers had passed, he and his team beat foot out of there as fast and as quietly as they could and rejoined the rest of his patrol. He reported the enemy soldiers his team had encountered, but decided not to say anything about the soldier he had seen. My dad kept this secret for many years, only telling me just before he passed, and earlier telling his grandmother on her deathbed in the 1970s. He said when he told his grandmother, she smiled and without opening her eyes told him, You saw old Red Tom. Red Tom was my great-great-grandfather, he was half black, half creek free man who was a scout for the Army Union during the Civil War. Later served with the U.S. Cavalry in the American West. He was known for carrying two pistols, a Spencer rifle, and a Creek War club in the battle. Midnight Monster here. That was our first creepy story of the day with many more to come. These stories are guaranteed to make the hair on your arms stand up. So subscribe to Midnight Monster as there's daily videos. Years ago, when I was eight, my family lived in this big, weird house, kind of on the edge of a small town. The school district was in the middle of a big reconstruction, so even though we were only a couple grades apart, my brother and I went to different schools and took different school buses. This left me as the last person to leave in the morning and the first person to get home in the afternoon, which meant it was my job to make sure all the lights were off and the doors were locked. One morning, I noticed the basement door was open and the light was on before I left. I turned off the light and closed the door. When I got home that afternoon, the light was on and the door was yet open again. I just assumed that I'd forgotten to actually take care of it when I noticed in the morning, so I went over to turn the light off and close the door. When I got to the top of the basement stairs, I looked and there was a big shadowy male figure towards the bottom of the staircase. I freaked out, slammed the door, and pushed a bunch of boxes against it, and then went and hid in my closet. For months, I did not tell my family because I was positive what I'd seen was a ghost, and I did not think anyone would believe me. Then, about a year after the incident, my mom and her boyfriend realized that small amounts of money had been going missing for months, totaling around 800 to 900 bucks, but never more than 60 at once. So we all walked around the house with flashlights trying to figure it out, how they could have gotten in. Turns out some creep was climbing in through a small hole in the outside of the house, shimmying through a crawl space then coming up in the house through the basement. 
Realizing I had been alone in the house with him on at least one occasion was one of my worst, most terrifying moments I've ever had. Many years ago, before there were cell phones, we had these things called pagers strapped to our hips. Someone would page you with their phone number and all you could call them back when you got to a phone. As an on-call technician working in the audio-visual field, my pager would go off all the freaking time. Like most people who use pagers, our clients knew that if you followed up your number with a 911, that would indicate to the technicians to stop what they're doing and call right away. Although I was always busy, I rarely ever got 911s. One afternoon traveling from Orlando to St. Petersburg via Interstate 4, my pager goes off with a number I don't recognize, followed by the 911. I find the first exit to pull into a little truck stop looking place outside of Plant City to use their payphone. This takes maybe three minutes top. I walk in, ask for some change, and head to the wall where there's four payphones to choose from. I pop to my quarter in and dial the number displayed on my trusty pager. It rings and rings and rings and rings some more. I'm thinking to myself, WTF, who would page me with a 911 and not answer their phone? It's just about then I noticed another ringing sound in addition to the one in my ear. I pull the handset from my ear and two phones over the wall, another payphone is ringing, but with an incoming call. I hang up my headset and the ringing stops on the other phone. I walk a few paces over, pick up the handset, and look at my phone number printed above the buttons. I look at the number on my pager. I look at the number on the phone. I look at the number on my pager again. I look at the phone again. Except for the 911, they are identical. I kind of lose my breath for a second and then I make my way over to a girl at the counter and ask if she saw anyone use this payphone. She said I was the only person in the store in the last hour. The whole episode probably took 15 minutes, but man, I was freaked out. The hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up and I just wanted out of there. I get about 10 miles down the highway and I come up to a scene that looked like a bomb went off. A four-car pileup involving a tractor trailer holding a long steel that had come loose. State troopers and paramedics just arriving. I pulled over to the side and helped the best I could, but it was all pretty much over once it began. I have no idea why I got that page or from whom or what, but I'm convinced that if I hadn't, I would not be alive to write this today. My family has a similar story, and I'm pretty sure some of you serial killer buffs out there might figure out who it is before the reveal because their story is pretty unique. When my parents were in college, they went on a trip down to Florida. They had met through mutual friends who were down there together but haven't gone on a date yet. My dad and one of his friends were planning to meet my mom and some of her friends at a hotel, but being the carefree college guys they were, they lost track of time and realized it was impossible to get to the hotel on time by walking. They decided the best solution to the problem was to hitch a hike and a car with two women who picked them up. Everything seemed fine until the driver asked them if it was okay to stop for gas. My dad and his friend agreed it was no problem since they were making good time and she drove into a gas station. She then pumped her car full of gas before hopping back in and flooring it, basically stealing the gas with two hitchhikers in the back. My dad and his friend were beginning to freak out when she pulled a gun from under her seat and asked, Are you going to have a problem or something like that? My dad and his friend shook their heads no vehemently because what else do you do in that situation? She then drove them to a hotel and dropped them off without as much as a scratch and they kind of thought nothing of it until the news started reporting on a serial killer in Florida known as Aline Wernos. He took one look at her picture and instantly recognized her as the driver. The only reason my dad thinks she did not straight up kill them was because they were super polite and respectful to her. And her victims were usually scumbag guys trying to take advantage of her. A bunch of girls in my friend group decided to have a night out and ended up at a local gay club. I can't remember why I didn't go, but I am sort of glad I wasn't there. However, I also wish I had been so I could have helped. Anyways. They noticed a girl on the dance floor who looked super out of place. She had sweatpants and a t-shirt on and wasn't wearing makeup and had her hair in a ponytail. She also had a backpack on. Basically, 
the exact opposite of typical club attire and not all what someone would usually wear to this place. They said that she seemed very dazed as well, and more importantly, there was a very large man grabbing her and grinding on her, and she was just kind of standing there letting it happen. One of my friends tried approaching to ask if she was alright, but the guy spoke up for her and insisted that he was her boyfriend and that she just had too much to drink. But she was okay. Everyone was suspicious, but at that point there wasn't much else that they could do, so they just kept an eye on the two of them. Eventually the guy left the dance floor to go to the bar, and my friend was able to talk to this girl again. She said that she was extremely out of it and that it seemed more likely that she had been drugged rather than just drunk. The girl managed to convey that she did not know the man she was with and wanted to leave. So my friend grabbed her and made for an exit, but not before the guy came back. He immediately flipped out, got right in my friend's face and started screaming at her. It escalated to the point that he eventually swung at my friend who just barely dodged the punch. Thankfully, Someone else had went and found a security guard and they were able to prevent this guy from hurting anyone, meaning that my friends and the girl were able to leave safely. She was still super messed up when they left, so nobody could get the full story, but she did say the guy had been following her around town all day. The really scary part is that the bar staff couldn't technically do anything other than throw the guy out after my friends had left. One of them called the cops and gave them a description of the guy, but they said they couldn't really do much other than be on the lookout for him. So, chances are he's still out there somewhere and may do this again. I have never said the following out loud or in text until recently. I opened up to my wife about it because of our new apartment. Anyways, I feel compelled to say here I am, a rational man, who believes in the scientific method. I believe not just what I see, but what can be verified. I have no explanation for what follows, but I can attest that everything is true to the best of my understanding. My grandmother was sensitive. I don't know how else to describe it. You'd be having a bad day and she'd call and say she had a feeling you needed to talk. Nothing super crazy or anything, but just always seemed to know what you were feeling, especially when distressed. No matter how far away you or she was or what she was doing, she would also be explicitly avoid ghost stories and the like. And while she was very spiritual, she refused to speak about her personal beliefs. I picked up whatever it was she had. My whole life I have just known things. I cannot describe it, but when I tried to talk to my wife about this the other night, I said it was like a smell, but with your skin. Like when my grandmother, I know what people are really feeling, always, and I've always been able to sense it. I don't know what they are. I ghost hunted for a year in my freshman year of college to try to find out, but I never got a satisfactory answer. I don't believe in ghosts, but I know there are things we just don't understand. For example, growing up we lived in an old townhouse that was the land of a man who was truly a monster, Lee Masters from Carroll County, MD. He owned a ton of land and had a habit of running it like a tarrant. He would regularly abuse his slaves, and when they would become pregnant, he would burn them alive at the limestone furnace he had on his land. I lived on this land. I helped to work on the archaeology dig that eventually dug up the furnace, confirming the myths to finding the bones of his burnt slaves. From the time I was a small child, I hated our house. My parents were going through a very rough and violent divorce, and I'm sure that this did not help, but I hated being alone. I could feel something with me all the time, and I knew it wasn't nice. It was like a dark shadow that hung in the corner of every room, especially in the basement and my room. For the longest time, I thought it was just childish fear of the dark, but then I had a brother. He is not sensitive, but he even felt it. We would both hear footsteps scratching at our bedroom door at night and heavy breathing. I would have a recurring dream every night of going to the top of the basement steps jumping down into the darkness and landing, climbing back up and doing it again. I've been able to confirm this from my parents if I actually did this, as I've been known to sleepwalk on occasion, but I was never hurt, and these were tall stairs. So, I'm inclined to think it was just a dream, but every night the same thing, down into the dark, to the point I started to lose sleep. It got worse as I got older, Lights would turn off and on, and the TV would cut out for no reason, then back on when we got back up to check it. Doors would open and close on themselves. 
I started to see actual shadows moving all the time out of the corner of my eye. Things would go missing and turn up in a strange place or months later as if they never had gone anywhere. I start to have the sensation at night that someone wanted to physically attack me. On one occasion, I remember having some sort of seizure. I think I was 9 or 10 at that point. I never spoke of this to anyone except my brother, and eventually he told me to stop talking about it too. We did move eventually, but not because of this. The further we got away from Lee Master's land, the less bad things became. Our new house was across the city, still his land, but not his living property. For a while, we did have the same, but it did not feel as heavy at the new house, if that makes sense. Things would happen, but it was no longer a constant presence. At time, these things would happen in front of other people, lights turning off and on and such. My one friend saw a shadow person with me. We were playing Age of Mythology in the basement and we both saw it move across the wall. I've never seen someone go so pale. It took him forever to come back to my house after that. Over time, the activity faded, especially as I moved further and further away from the master's estate. I put these things out of my mind like I said I'm a rational person. This shit is just crazy. To even type this makes me feel like I'm a lunatic because I mean come on. So I forget about it. Occasionally my brother mentions how since I moved out things stopped happening but mostly we just didn't talk about it. Recently I got a job as a property manager. The woman before me died in the apartment I get to live in of an opioid overdose. She was here for three days and her dog had to eat her face to survive. When we moved in, I felt it again. The presence. Not as heavy, not the same, but something there. I put it out of my mind. I ghost hunted for a year, again. I know the rules. Pay it no mind and it will go away. The woman passed suddenly and violently. She probably was just hanging around to come to terms. My wife spoke to her. Told her thank you for the apartment and to move on. She did this without talking to me and without me to her. I mean, what was I going to say? Honey, I can feel someone here. Ignore it until it goes away. She's my wife and I love her, but if she said that to me, would I buy it? Anyways, since then I felt more of the I can see her. Never directly, but I get that smell with my skin every time she's in the room. I know what she looks like even though I've never met her. She just comes and watches, but it's getting stronger and stronger. I cannot explain it in words, but such a physically overpowering sensation on my skin, I had to tell my wife. I have not felt this since I was a child, and even then I figured it was all in my head. When I told my wife what I was feeling, she said that day that she spoke with women. Our dog started sniffing around like crazy. She eventually rooted out a plastic bag from under the heater. It was filled with bloody gauze pads. Probably the woman who lived here before us. She did have an opioid addiction and would shoot heroin. These pads were probably what she used on her arm. My wife said she had independently been having the same feeling that someone was around, and that's why she spoke to her in the first place. We've since gone on to ignore it, but what I can't ignore is what I feel, and I think I have what my grandmother had, but I don't have the name for it or an explanation for what's going on, and that makes me feel afraid. Is consciousness a natural phenomenon like radio waves and our bodies just antennas that pick up specific frequencies for a time? Is her frequency still vibrating in this apartment? Do I have some kind of recessive gene that gives me a broader perception of the fourth dimension? And, as such, I can pick up on this woman for whatever reason. And why does it seem to be places where negative things happened? Why not positive things like the spot where two people fell in love? I never get anything from stuff like that, not unless it's truly overpowering, in which case most folks pick it up on it anyways. So this happened about five years ago. I was living with my grandmother at the time. It's a long story why, but the short of it is, I was working during two years off before university and my parents live a 45 minute drive out of the city and insuring a car and rent is expensive as hell for a 19 year old. So. We lived within a few blocks from an absurdly large mall with a very large area surrounding it that has been very slowly getting progressively sketchier. Nothing like an abuse or murderer, but enough. Example, one guy asked me for a smoke and when I said I didn't smoke and thus didn't have one, he started shouting profanities at me and calling me a liar before attempting to follow me home. 
but nothing compared to what happened one night. My grandma and I were both going to bed where there was a knock on the door. Now, my grandmother had dementia and despite the fact that she's super smart and could hide it insanely well, she did some really odd thing and was really paranoid. Paranoid enough to make it less of a pain to look out the window to see what it was to remove the meticulously placed noise barricade from the door and check the peephole. Turns out, some weird woman was crouching down in front of the door with a large blunt weapon. I'm not sure what it was, but it was similar to a baseball bat. My bedroom was right next to the front door with a window near the ground. It opened outwards from the bottom from a crank, which meant it did not open very much. The woman tried to force her way through the window. My grandmother was terrified, but dementia works both ways. It took me 30 seconds to get her to stop trying to approach the woman and get her into the bedroom across the hall. I told her to lock the door and call the police. The woman kept whispering that she was cold and wanted to come inside and sleep. It took me yelling that I would cut her hand off if she did not retract it to get her to go away. And she still sulked around the house for an hour after that, trying all the windows. My grandmother did in fact call the police, but they never came. This happened to my parents sometimes after my sibs and I moved out as adults, and they still lived in the big house as empty nesters. They're asleep and all of a sudden my mom's here frantic knocking and a woman screaming, Help me! Help me! He's after me! Our dogs are barking and going crazy. She keeps banging, but my dad was about to run down when my mom stopped him because she said it felt suspicious. I forgot why I think it was because it sounded a little fake. My mom had left the entranceway light on and the woman could see inside from the big window next to the front door. We lived on a quiet road in upstate New York and therefore my parents would not go downstairs to assess the situation without being seen by the knocker. My dad has the idea to keep the upstairs light off while looking out the window from the room on the second floor that faced the front. He gets to my old room and looks out to the side window by chance. I had the corner room and sees what looks like a man crouching in the bushes. My mom called the police immediately and sure enough, as they roll up a few minutes later, a guy runs out from the bushes of the street and proceeds at a leisurely pace as if he were going for a night jog. The police questioned the two people but couldn't legally hold them because apparently the jogger insisted he was jogging. And the woman, I forgot what she said, but they did not have the reason to arrest them. Anyways, Later that week, my parents hear that two neighborhoods over, different police precinct, a couple had been tied up and robbed by a pair of con artists who made their way in by a woman pretending to be in distress. Midnight Monster here. That was eight stories of the creepiest real-life situations that people have ever encountered. If you enjoyed today's stories, make sure you subscribe to the channel. There's going to be plenty more as Midnight Monster releases daily videos.